how much more productive, how much more enabled are people to move up the corporate ranks if they can bring their whole selves to work? It's an incredibly important thing. Welcome to Speaking of Business, conversations with Canadian innovators, entrepreneurs, and business leaders. I'm Goldie Hyder, President and CEO of the Business Council of Canada. And the voice you just heard belongs to Jackie Parchman, CEO of Mercer Canada and one of only a very few black women CEOs in this country. I spoke with her a few weeks ago at the end of a summer punctuated by protests over racial injustice. We all remember the shocking death of George Floyd at the hands of Minneapolis police in May. By late August, the police shooting of Jacob Blake in Kenosha, Wisconsin was also in the headlines. In the months between those two events, we learned the names of countless others, be they black, indigenous, or people of color, who have experienced violent acts of racism and discrimination. They have led to protests around the world and some important and difficult conversations about how to end racism in our communities. Earlier this summer, I was honored to participate in the Black North Summit. The virtual meeting brought together business leaders from across the country who made commitments to take action to end anti-black racism in their workplaces. It was really inspiring to see many leaders pledge to bring about real change. But change doesn't happen overnight. What do companies need to do now to keep the momentum going over the coming months and years? Jackie Parchment brings a unique perspective to this discussion. In addition to heading up Mercer Canada, she is also a director of the Black North Initiative and a founding member of the Black Opportunity Fund. She's a passionate advocate for diversity and inclusion in corporate Canada. Jackie, I'm very pleased you could join us for this important conversation. It's so great to be here, Goldie. You know, as I said in this introduction, there's just so much happening, so much to talk about. But before we go there, who are you? What's your journey? How did you end up being where you are? Well, listen, I'm many things. You know, my day job, as you said, I'm really proud to serve as CEO of Mercer Canada. I'm a Black woman. I'm an immigrant from Jamaica. I'm a sister. I'm a friend. I'm a member of the community. I'm a godmother. I'm many things. I'm many things. So, Jackie, we're speaking in late August, just after the shooting of Jacob Blake. And that shooting happened after months of scrutiny and worldwide protests and calls for action against racism. How are you feeling about the fact that we're going through it again? You know, Goldie, I think if you speak with most Black people in Canada, the word that you'll hear most often is tired and exhausted. So first and foremost, most of the references that you've made to violent acts refer to the United States, acts in the United States. I'd also like to draw your attention to some of the really horrifying statistics that are coming out in Canada, because it is just so important for us as a community to acknowledge that this is not just an American problem. So there's been some great work done in terms of finally, finally acknowledging and looking at the data on treatment of Blacks in Canada. So some examples. If you look at the incidence of COVID with respect to Black people in Toronto, 21% of the infections are Black. People who are infected are Black. We are less than 9% of the population. The white population is close to 50% of people in Toronto. And there are fewer white people who have COVID in this city. So that is a sign that there's something deeply wrong in terms of our healthcare system and in terms of the systemic racism that we face. Really painful statistics around opportunity for Black children in our school boards where twice as many Black children right now are being streamed out of academic courses as white children. And we certainly, certainly have seen our own incidents of violence perpetrated against Black people by the police here in Canada. So Rolling all of this up, it just feels like so much. So on the one hand, I am proud. I am happy to see that there's so much conversation about this. And I do feel that there's a willingness to walk through the door and make change this time. 
but it is just exhausting at the same time to see these terrible things happening and to see the statistics in our own community. It's interesting. I was going to ask you later on about the COVID situation and the impact because it is quite clear and your statistics just validate that, that while we say the virus doesn't discriminate in terms of borders and so forth, it actually does discriminate on socioeconomic. Are you seeing that as a moment in which the journey back can start by helping people at the most basic of levels? Absolutely. So really proud to be part of two important initiatives, Black North and the Black Opportunity Fund. With my work with the Black Opportunity Fund, I co-lead a work stream that deals with community outreach, which means that we are literally meeting with dozens of community organizations, including organizations that deal with health and Black health, many of the leading Black physician organizations across Canada. And this is a topic of real conversation, the disproportionate impact that COVID has had on our community. And I'd say part B of this is also the impact that we're seeing in terms of Black mental health. And that comes from the fatigue (laughs) at having to see incident after incident, statistic after statistic, as well as just the fact that the healthcare system, we don't think is as responsive to the needs of our community. You mentioned mental health as well. Another area that I know you and uh, many others are quite concerned about where we are. How much concern do you have about the damage that's going to be done during COVID and where we will be from a post-pandemic perspective? Because that's a lasting impact when you're talking about mental health. It is a lasting impact. So as we said at the top of this, I'm many things. I'm really proud to be CEO of my firm, Mercer Canada. I'm concerned about mental health for everybody, right? You know, we're doing a lot in my organization to try and secure and do more to enable the mental health of our people, including speaking openly and not being shy about the impact it's having on all of us, including our leadership. And we're also helping many of our clients deal with this as well. But, you know, we have to remind ourselves as we move into this marathon, and it has become a marathon, how deeply weird this time is, right? Mm -hmm. Like you can be tempted to think, oh, we're all functioning pretty well. You wake up thinking, is this really happening? (laughs) Absolutely. And and you have to stop yourself sometimes and acknowledge how deeply weird this is. So yeah, I think it's very important for all of us to be aware of the toll that COVID is taking on all of Canada. But certainly if you're part of a community that is so disproportionately affected, if you are much more likely to have relatives friends, loved ones impacted by COVID, if you are also more likely to face vulnerability in terms of losing your job or having to be on the direct front line as a Black community is, yes, I'm especially worried for our community. You're partially implying this, and and I may have said this on another podcast or our listeners might have heard it, but my wife had seen something way back on the internet in March where it effectively said, are we the virus and is COVID the vaccine. And I wonder if the attention being given to racism in this issue would be the same if we were all just living our daily lives and we didn't have the working from home moment and the TV's on all the time or we're, we're chatting way more, or we're Zooming way more. This, this may be, you know, you don't want to use this word in a health crisis, but this moment, this chance to get it right If we don't get it right now, are you concerned that we might just return to regularly scheduled programming afterwards and everybody will move on and say, well, that was an issue, but, you know, it'll always be there. Well, first, I think your wife sounds like a really smart lady. (laughs) Well, she saw it on the Internet, in fairness to her. I just memorized the line. (laughs) But she's smart nevertheless. (laughs) It's good that she called it out. Um, I think that's a really interesting perspective. And the short answer is I don't think that we would be paying as much attention Mm. to the racial issues unfolding in front of us if it wasn't for COVID. There is something about heightened emotion at this time, us all being at home, that I think has made it different. And yeah, I will say to you, Goldie, that if you're a member of the Black community or if you're a a person of color in this country, there is real fear that if we don't act and act quickly to capture and seize this moment, (laughs) that the moment will move on and that if it's not now, when will we be able to kick the door open and enact change? Well, speaking of seizing the moment, uh, our mutual friend, Wes Hall, who's been a guest uh, on our podcast and the founder of the Black North Initiative, 
has pulled off with the support of three co-chairs, all of whom I'm proud to say are members of the Business Council of Canada. Let's educate the listener about what role you think Corporate Canada can play in moving the ball down the field on this issue. Corporate Canada has a huge role to play. So first, you know, immediately to recognize that Corporate Canada needs to look more like Canada. And we are very, very far from that point. So uh, you will have heard all the statistics from Wes and from others at Black North. There is such a gap between the population of our leadership in this country in corporate Canada and how that population looks versus how we Canadians look. You said at the top of this podcast that I'm one of very few Black female CEOs. And, you know, I, I know that. I know that because people often don't believe I'm a CEO, believe it or not. So um, so there's tremendous work to do because you cannot expect to make progress and to have a booming economy and to continue to have Canada be the great country it is and have it be even greater if you are only drawing from a pool that's very small. We need to have all Canadians included in corporate Canada and included at all levels, not just at the entry level, if we're going to make Canada as wonderful as it possibly can be. Yeah, and you know, I talk about corporate Canada for obvious reasons, but I feel like this is a real all-in moment. Professional sports is taking a stand from basketball to baseball to hockey. They're calling each other out on what needs to be done. Do you think this widespread attention to this issue is exactly what's needed to finally deal with this as a society? Well, I, I certainly think we have the opportunity. Um, by nature, I am a glass half full person. So I believe we can get it right, but I don't think we can underestimate how hard the work will be. So I think there are many corporations, there are many individuals in our society that have put a down payment on making it right by acknowledging, by starting to do the hard work of understanding the complex problem. But there's so much more to do to get to where we need to be. I will say one thing that I found incredibly hopeful and interesting, Goldie, was at the start of the real conversation about race, when I looked at the protesters that were on our streets, particularly in Canada, and I looked at the skin color of those protesters, such a diverse group, particularly of young people. If you're a CEO or a leader in this country and you looked at who was on the streets, you have to realize that it's not just your Black workforce or the people of color in your workforce or Black Canadians that care about this. Many, many Canadians care about this. And that gives me hope because if you're paying attention, you will realize that there is a huge expectation that now needs to be fulfilled. You recently wrote a piece in the Globe and Mail in July about the difference between inclusion and belonging in the workplace. Here's what you wrote just for our listeners' benefit. I sat in meetings, attended networking events and activities, and started to notice and think about the thousand seemingly small things that happen at work every day that might make an employee feel like they don't belong. Explain to me the difference between inclusion and belonging and what are some of those ways that even ignorantly or innocently, people are made to feel like they don't belong? So inclusion is, uh, you know, when corporations or others are consciously seeking to reach out and make people feel like they're welcome. Belonging is where it's just seamless, where you just feel like you can walk into the workplace and you can be entirely who you are where you don't have to put a different face on, where you don't have to pretend to be something that you are not. And how much more productive, how much more enabled are people to move up the corporate ranks if they can bring their whole selves to work? It's an incredibly important thing. Yeah, that's very well said. And when I read this, it reminded me of the importance of words labels, the meanings behind them. I've often, as a minority myself, never really liked the word tolerate. I've always felt that that's what you're asked to do when a baby's crying on a plane. 
yeah, I'm going to have to tolerate this, right? But understanding it would be to say, geez, the baby must be hungry or needs a diaper change or something. So I think the words that you've stressed here really matter. And I think that in society, you know, and even the best of intentions still get measured by actions and outcomes. And that's where we are. So how do we now sustain this momentum that's developed over the course of the last few months to make sure that this has an outcome that we all say, wow, we, we actually changed things? Yeah, so it's going to be complicated. So first and foremost, recognize how important it is that we do this. So to this point, Goldie, throughout this conversation, we have mainly be talking about the empathy side of the argument for diversity. Let's not forget the economic side of this. So going back to my point about the people on the streets, as a Black woman, I was heartened by that for all the reasons I just said. As a CEO, I thought to myself, wow, this is a reminder to me that particularly millennials in my workforce and the generations that come after them have an expectation of diversity. So if you want to have the best possible workforce and attract and retain who you want, you have to make sure it's diverse, both because it's going to give you better outcomes, better conversations, you'll have more colleagues of diversity on the workforce, but you'll also, I think, do a better job of attracting and retaining white colleagues and colleagues of other colors. So let, let's not forget the economic argument. Also, I think it's really important right now, right today, to put a stake in the ground with respect to stating what your actions are going to be and how you will measure your organization and the consequence of not achieving those actions. So I'm on record as saying that you need to listen in order to really fully bake your diversity plan. So many organizations, myself included, are continuing to listen. But I think I think uh, your workforce has an expectation of seeing some action. So starting to talk about, starting to articulate the goals that you are going to work towards, how you will measure yourself against those goals and the consequence to your leadership if you don't attain those goals. So many of those, uh, many of the things that can actually move us to action and, and put the stake in the ground are in the Black North Pledge. So obviously I'm a huge supporter of organizations signing on for that. There's some organizations that have not, but have come out and put the stake in the ground and said, this is what we will do and this is how we will measure. And uh, if you don't do that now, I think a year from now, it's going to be hard to see that you will have made progress. Yeah, and I can see this issue getting to the place where the environmental issues have gotten to for many corporations, right? It's become a shareholder issue. It's become a financing issue. It's become, uh, and as you pointed out, in terms of recruitment and retention and attracting the best talent. So you anticipated my next question because it was about the importance and the economic argument for creating a culture of belonging. You've mentioned the listening. Uh, I want to ask about the current environment which we're operating. Do you feel that resentment might be building in any way, shape, or form? Do you think that there's a risk that from a CEO perspective, as someone who needs talent and labor, are you worried about the ability to get that talent and labor from an immigration perspective, from a skills perspective, diversity aside, just as a CEO looking to grow your business and address the aging issues that every businesses are facing? How are you feeling about some of those things? And do you think we can, as many are saying, come back better and come back stronger out of all of this on these kinds of issues? Um, so yes and yes would be the short answer. So certainly before COVID, actually through COVID, you know, a big part of my job is reaching out to our clients, speaking with the C-suite of the clients that we work with. And Mercer does everything to help organizations keep, find, promote the best talent. Uh, any organization that I talk to, whether it's a large pension fund, whether it's a bank, whether it's a, a tech firm, when I say what is the biggest issue that or concern that's on your mind, it's talent consistently, consistently. No question. So now we're in COVID and yes, many organizations are pausing, maybe retrenching a little bit, maybe retrenching a lot, unfortunately, in some organizations on hiring their workforce. But this is not going to last because their fundamental demographic 
issues that we face in Canada. You talked about our aging workforce. And fundamentally, we're a country that should be in growth mode. So we're going to come out of COVID. We know we're going to come out of COVID. We know in the long run, it's going to be fine. Definition of the long run, I guess, is a question mark. You don't want to come out of COVID and uh, not have great talent and not have the people that you want to work for you want to work for you. So it does mean that as we think through COVID and as we think through what we've learned through COVID, and I, my organization has learned a lot and I know our clients have learned a lot, you need to marry that with the thought process that you're going through on diversity. And yeah, build back better. Can you share with us some of the things that you or your clients have learned through this? Certainly. So the importance of transparency, clarity, understanding how your employees are feeling through COVID. I think this is a moment, I hate to use the word branding because it sounds it's, it sounds a little cold, uh, but I think that... Um, I think that how your employees think about you and their engagement level is really going to be defined by this moment. Yeah, I think it speaks a lot to character. It defines who you are as a person, as a leader. It defines who you are, who your organization is, what your mm -hmm. culture is. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, it defines your leadership. So what did you do to keep your employees safe? What did you do to keep your employees whole? And I mean mentally whole as well as physically whole. And yeah, no one is expecting that corporations are, are not going to care about profit or staying in business. You have to worry about empathy and you have to worry about economics. And the two 100% have to be intertwined. Mm -hmm. Your company cannot do well if your employees are not well. Your employees will not be well if your company is not financially well. So how you express that and how you live that, I think will resonate with your employees long after COVID is over. Can I ask, where are you drawing your wisdom from? So many, many sources, <laughs> uh, starting with um, the fundamentals that were taught to me by my family and my parents, who un unfortunately are, are, are no longer with us. I've been fortunate to have some fantastic mentors along the way, by the way, pretty much 100% white men. So when you talk about, um, you know, helping black people and women advance, you don't have to always be a person of color or a woman. I think that's a very important point. A lot of people think that only your own will understand. It's not at all about that. No, it's about being willing to engage with people that can support you and people that you can support. You do not have to look like the person that you're mentoring and sponsoring and vice versa. If I had uh, relied on that, there is zero chance I would be where I am today because there was almost no one who looked like me along the journey. Mm. In terms of other sources of support, of course, I read a lot. I'm really fortunate, actually, that with much of the advocacy work that I'm, I'm doing, I get to be with other really smart, um, community-minded people, and I draw inspiration from that as well. What are you reading right now? So listen, um, you know, life is pretty heavy these days. So I got to say, I'm big into escapism. So there is a Canadian murder mystery series by a woman uh, by the name of Louise. Uh, I think her, name, her first name is Louise Penny. And she writes a, a series with an inspector Gamache, her hero. Uh, it's based in the eastern townships of Quebec. And I am on book number 11. Wow, you've escaped. <laughs> we need to find you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm on book number 11 of 19 and really happy that I have eight more to go and keep me distracted. Now, you and I make a pretty interesting pair. Let me tell you why. And you said your father is of Jamaican heritage. Is it father and mother of Jamaican heritage? They were both from the Caribbean. Caribbean. Okay. So you've got a Jamaican background. I have East Indian parents. You know who else has East Indian <laughs> parents and Jamaican mix? Let me guess. Go ahead. Guess. Our friend, Miss Kamala Harris. There you go. So I'm wondering at a time like this, where we have a vice president nominee, given the conversation we've had, how important is that? Is it just symbolism or is it much more? It is incredibly important. So first, the symbolism itself, I think, is important, Goldie. 
you know, one of the one of the things I've had to face, and I know you will have had to face this as well, is there's so few people that look like you that sometimes people don't believe that you are in the role that you are. So, you know, in the building that I live in, I've been mistaken for the cleaning lady on more than one occasion. And I've actually had many people say to me, you don't look like a CEO. So I'm hopeful that if there is a vice president of the United States that looks like Kamala Harris, or even the fact that there's a nominee, it, it, it starts to set a tone that people can look and understand that that diversity does exist. So inspiration for young black girls, for young Indian girls, for young mixed girls, it's it's an incredibly powerful symbol, but also just just showing to the world that we can be more than people assume we can be. I would normally want to end it right there, Jackie, but this has been such a great conversation and I really want to ask you a question to put hope out there. Fast forward a year from now, two years from now, what sort of change do you hope to see? So first and foremost, I hope that all the talented Black volunteers that I'm drawing from universities across Canada, that they all have great jobs. That would say something, right? I hope that we start to see that there really is a pipeline of talent building in corporate Canada, being given the kind of opportunity that will allow them to get to where we can be. Um, I hope that myself and other people of color don't all have at least one incident that they can report where they're mistaken for the janitor, the cleaning lady. Every black person has that story. Everybody has that story. So it would be great in two years, not to have had any of those stories in two years. Or any more deaths by the police. Yes, and yes, if we get to a point where we stop as Black parents and Black aunties and Black cousins having to have a different conversation with Black sons than we'd have to have if we were white with our sons, I think that would be the ultimate sign. Of progress. Well, look, you said it yourself, glass half full. And I think it's because of people like you and your leadership and the journey that you've taken and the fact that you share it as openly as you do, that's going to help us get there. So thank you so much for doing this. I think I could have gone on for twice the time, but I uh, am very respectful of who you are and what you do as a CEO, Jackie. So <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much for spending time with me. Really appreciate the opportunity. You have a great day. Jackie Parchment is the CEO of Mercer Canada. She's also a founding member of the Black Opportunity Fund and a director of the Black North Initiative. If you would like to hear more of our Speaking of Business conversations with innovators, leaders, and entrepreneurs, why not subscribe to our podcast? You can find it wherever you get your podcasts or simply go to our website, speakingofbiz.ca. Until next time, I'm Goldie Hyder. Thanks for joining us. Stay safe, everyone.